I'm going to have a little change of pace here. And I'm going to talk about why we go to space, what we learn from space, and then finally I'll talk about my experiences in sending astronauts to space. This is a real joy, okay. Um, there have been 618 astronauts that have gone to Earth orbit. I've sent 374 of those astronauts in my tenure at NASA. So six out of 10 astronauts have been to orbit, lived under my care. Not one of those astronauts had any health problems or any problems with the vehicles that they were on. I wanted to shuttle 60 times. It's a shame that we don't have the shuttle anymore, but we now have better devices. And I'm going to get into some pretty heavy stuff. And when I decided to take the job, the Cold War had just ended, and I spent 25 That's years right. into my career working to take down the Soviet Union. I was in national security operations. And the Cold War ended on um, New Year's Eve of 1991. I was appointed NASA Administrator, April 1st, 2022. No sooner had I taken the job when President George H.W. Bush said, Dan, I want to meet with Boris Yates. I spent 25 years working against the Russians, but he was such a forward thinker, he understood the impact of history. And the Western powers made a terrible mistake at the end of World War I, which ended up leading to World War II. So his thinking was, let's see if we could do something constructive with the Russians. It was like an out-of-body experience going to the places that I had targeted during the Cold War. But Boris Yeltsin invited me to go. So, as soon as I took the job, it was clear part of the mission was going to be the search for life. In fact, I started a program called Origins. Origin, Evolution, and Destiny of the Universe and Life Therein. And I knew I was getting into some rather difficult territory because this is a hard subject for many people to deal with. And I'm going to give you some evidence of some of the things we learned from the five great observatories that I personally led. So I decided I would meet with the religious leaders of the world just to make sure that there was no concern about the federal government delving into things about the origin of everything the origin of life. So I appointed Father Minogue, who was at the Loyola University here in uh, Chicago, and I asked him to put together a committee of top religious minds, and we met with religious leadership, and then he being a Catholic said, Dan, you need to go meet Pope John Paul II. Ah, I have some more room here. Thank you. Um, and it was quite an experience. And I'll, I'll play out a little bit of it so you can get some of the personality of Pope John for the second. I met with him, and he, he had um, uh, a disease where his fingers were shaped, and they gave him a drug every morning, and if they gave him too much, he would fall asleep. Too little, he would shake. And this particular morning, he fell asleep, so I had to meet with him, standing up. So I walked into the room, and it was quite interesting. The Pope, his back, he had a, a bone problem, so his back was like this, and his head was tilted this way. And the Secretary of State of the Vatican was over here. I was standing here. 
uh, the Pope was here and I was standing there. So he looked at the Secretary of State of the Vatican, and the Secretary of State of the Vatican said, Your Holiness, I'd like to introduce you to Dan Golden, the President of NASA. <laughs> now, I had a question, do I correct the Secretary of State of the Vatican <laughs> and tell him I'm the NASA administrator? No, I decided to keep my mouth shut. So the Pope, we hadn't just said anything yet, so he's looking at him, and then he turned, and he looked at me. And then he turned backwards and looked at the Secretary of State of the Vatican, and he said, what's NASA? <laughs> and then he turned to me and broke out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and from that point, he, he wanted to break the ice because we came from such different polarity, different countries, different religions, different training. He was trained as an actor in Poland. And I got into one of the deepest discussions about the origins of the universe, the origin of life. And I brought with me a montage of evidence. And I'm going to walk you through the evidence so I, I won't uh, say it in advance. And after a very long conversation, he looked at me. And I was all I was asking him to say is, Dan, this is OK for NASA to go do it. The church would not really be upset. And he looked at me like this, and he said, Dan, space is revealing that you walked away. <laughs> it was. So now let me dig a little uh, bit into the subject of origins. And you'll understand why I gave this preamble in a few minutes. I have here a statement of the talk. It's called Golden in the Web. I'll walk you through the five observatories that I preside over. A gamma ray observatory, an X-ray observatory, a UV invisible observatory, that's the Hubble telescope, an infrared observatory, and um, a very large infrared observatory, the Web. And the web is up there now. It's doing amazing work, which I will walk you through. So let's, how do I switch to the next slide on? There it is. So let's walk through all of it. And let's go through some of the evidence. So here we have the Hubble Space Telescope. And when I got to NASA, the Hubble Space Telescope had an astigmatism. It cost $5 billion. And they had a little annular ring in the main mirror, and it couldn't see. So the first task was to shoot up the barrel of the mirror as it came flying over and get an optical prescription. And after we got an optical prescription, we had to go to contact lens. The contact lens was a thousand pounds, and it there's people here old enough to know what a phone booth was. It was the size of a phone booth, 1,000 pounds. And we had to put that contact lens on the telescope. We did. And right here is the first picture we got. This is a nebula, which is basically the material that stars form in. It's metallic dust. It's gas. And it's hydrocarbons, and perhaps even some amino acids. We'll get to that in a minute. This is called a star nursery because inside of these clouds, stars are ignited. So we're seeing creation of the ultimate kind just looking at this nursery. The next one. This is an interesting one. This is the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. I built this while I was an aerospace executive. And this observatory sees in gamma rays. 
And gamma rays uh, come from dying stars called supernovas. There's a lot of energy to them. And it took a picture of the Milky Way. This is our galaxy. And all the action here are dying stars called supernovas and gamma rays are being emitted. And it gets into some of the deeper science. I don't have time for that today, but I just thought this was a beautiful picture. Uh, it was interesting when we launched this, this boom didn't come off. It was hanging from the shelf. Space war in the back of my career fully. <laughs> Next one. This is a very interesting one. This is the Chandra Sakar X ray Observatory. There are different energy particles that take place in different phenomena in the universe. And this is a picture of a singular star that's dying. Stars are being born and stars are dying all the time. And on top of that, it's beautiful. And for the Chandra X ray observatory, Chandra Sakar, again, I did this while I was in the aerospace industry that has grazing X ray incidents mirrors. So I had the joy of figuring out how to grind those mirrors while I was running a loop of 10,000 people but it worked. Now, this is the real interesting one. This is the Spitzer Space Telescope. And the Spitzer Space Telescope, it takes pictures in long wave infrared. These are the very coldest objects that are in the universe. And this is something else in this picture, which I'll get to. But the Spitzer Space Telescope, found amino acids in interstellar space. Amino acids are the building blocks of life. This happened to be a tryptophan amino acid. There have been other amino acids. And over the last 30 years, we found 256 complex hydrocarbons distributed all over the universe. And the reason they're able to exist is in the nebula, there's little particles of metallic particles, they stick onto the metallic particles and it blocks the ultraviolet radiation from ripping it apart. So now just think about this. Distributed throughout the universe, of complex hydrocarbons, building blocks of protein, building blocks of life. And now I'll come to our own solar system. And when I was seven years old, my father took me to the Museum of Natural History in the Haiti Planetarium in New York City, and I saw a meteorite. And later on, it was discovered that meteorites had amino acids, the building blocks of life. And there's a lot of debris in our own solar system. And it's thought that the distribution of these organic molecules is what got to Earth. Another clue, on Earth, wherever we find a heat source, like a deep ocean vent, or a hot pool, and we have some nutrients in the water, you will find life. So now you have to say to yourself, are we alone? I think the probability is pretty low uh, that we are alone. The arts, there's some more information here. One of the objects was of these telescopes, namely the Spitzer and the Webb Space Telescope in the Hubble, was looked back to the beginning of creation and understand the origin of the universe and the evolution. So this Spitzer Space Telescope 
worked in concert with the web, which I'll get to in a minute, and they took these deep field pictures, and if you see these numbers, two, five, three, one, I don't see four. Right down the bottom. Ah, there it is. Those are the oldest stars that we've ever seen, and it's approaching the time that those stars form. Shortly, some a few hundred million light years after the formation of the universe. The universe was formed 13.857 billion years ago. And it came within hundreds of millions of years. So now let me get, I think, we have one more. Let's go to the next one. And this is the web. I had the joy while being NASA administrator of doing the conceptual design of that telescope. And everyone was twitchy and they didn't think it was going to work. But it did. And we are a human species that's curious, and sometimes people say, why are you spending money doing that? But part of life is understanding where did we come from and where are we going. And again, this is the first light that came from the web, and it came very beginning, very close to the beginnings of creation. I don't have a whole bunch of time to go into it, but this is what I'd like to tell you. You could go back almost to the beginning of everything with the Big Bang. And in fact, we can actually measure the background reverberations. It's called the background cosmic radiation. And we can see those reverberations, but we can't peer back beyond that. So you have to go with uh, mathematical analysis. But the thought is that everything existed was in something the size of the top digit of my thumb. It exploded, <coughs> it expanded. You can speed see the reverberations of that. And now you understand why I spoke to Joe, Pope John Flores. <coughs> uh, next slide. Now let's get to exploration and why we need spacesuits and why we need space medicine. We have sent a number of robots to Mars, and this is a picture, I believe, from Spirit or Opportunity, I can't remember which one. Again, I had the chance of overseeing the initiation of those programs and got launched after I left. But when we take a look at pictures from orbit, and when we take a look at some of these pictures, it becomes clear that Mars, in high probability, had an ocean. And this is a sense of what Mars might have looked like. And what happened was Earth and Mars and Mercury, and Venus, from the beginning of creation about, of our solar system about five billion years ago. They were initially hot, they started to cool down, and they all became warm and wet with dense atmospheres of carbon dioxide. But a strange thing happened Mercury and Venus were so close to the sun, it blew all the atmosphere away. Although Venus has a very dense carbon dioxide atmosphere, but it's 700 degrees, not comfortable to live with. I don't know what's underneath the clouds, we'll find out. But Mars is one third the mass of Earth. And Mars, the core cooled down, the thing that keeps the Earth going and keeps our atmosphere is we have tectonic activity. So the volcanoes shoot out carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide comes down into the ocean. It forms sediment, forms to the bottom. The bottom of the ocean floor moves. It goes down into the earth. 
the carbonates get absorbed and then get shot out. So the Earth is able to have an atmosphere of 14.7 psi. What happened to Mars is it's smaller, so it cooled down faster, and the molten core became solid. The tectonic activity stopped, and the replacement of the carbon dioxide didn't take place. And the solar wind, the sun puts out a wind of high energetic particles. It swept away the carbon dioxide. So unfortunately, Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. Mars has an atmosphere of one hundredth the Earth of the carbon dioxide pressure. Earth is 14.7, it's 0.147 psi. Not very helpful for people to live in. But what it does have is water. Underneath the carbon dioxide ice cap on the South Pole, there's a huge amount of water, and there's also water in different places and frozen water on the planet. If it was all to melt, Mars would have an ocean 30 meters high. Not bad, so there could be life there. But the question is, this is a lot more difficult than sending astronauts to the Axiom Space Station. The dilemma is, when you're in low Earth orbit, you're protected by the Earth's magnetic fields, which causes the high-energy particles, uh, the galactic particles that come from those big explosions I showed you from the dying stars. Very high energy, they go zipping through your body. But in low Earth orbit, the astronauts are pretty much okay. There's some radiation, it's not too bad. When you get to Mars, when you travel to Mars, the radiation is so intense, you can get a pretty good dose of cancer. You can get a variety of other diseases. So this optimism of going to Mars may be a little overstated. I don't know that Elon's going to go next year. And if he does go, he might not be too healthy. And the dilemma is we can't go to Mars fast. A round trip mission is three years. And now I'll get into some physiology. Having launched all those people to the space station and been deeply involved with space medicine, we know that we could send people to space with the kind of things that these gentlemen talked about. Three months, you go, you come back, you can pretty well normalize. You may be able to go six months or a year. But remember, it's lower than orbit. It does not have the high energy galactic particles, which could, it rewrites your DNA. And then there are some other problems that you have when you go to space. We take gravity for granted. Gravity takes the blood and it puts a pressure, the blood's down on my feet. Now, if I go to space, there's no gravity. What's going to happen? The blood goes to my brain. And it changes the way the heart pumps. And instead of being an oval, the heart becomes a sphere. It's much less efficient. So when people make all these statements, we know what we're doing, we know where we're going, we are about the 2% point on the understanding of how to send humans to space responsibly. And we also are projecting a little bit too far when we say if we could go to low Earth orbit, we could go to the moon and Mars. One of the things I worry about is the amount of money, I know it was wonderful what the Canadians are doing and the pioneering work they have, but the fact of the matter is the medicine that has to be done responsibly is such a small fraction of the space program. And then you think about what happens if we do gene splicing? What happens if we use some of these new artificial intelligence tools? So one of the things that 
of these successes that you're going to have to think about is how do we balance the budget and responsibly put things into things that Axiom can't afford to do. These are the way out things that governments need to do in terms of dealing with the kind of health problems you're going to have. Because there's abundance out there, and now I'll we'll give you a little bit more information and I'll shut up. Goldman Sachs said the first trillionaire on Earth is going to be the person that mines the near-Earth asteroids. Because if you go to the near-Earth asteroids, you don't have to fall into the gravity well of the moon, albeit it's less than Earth, but you have to fall and it takes energy and you have to come out. In Earth orbit, in orbit about the sun, a little bit beyond the orbit of Earth, there are a, a measurable amount of rare metals, gold, platinum, silver. There are rare earths. There are metals that are crucial for manufacturing. You can manufacture there in a much more efficient way. So when we start thinking of real manufacturing operations and real commercial space, there are fufu commercial operations going to go to the moon because it's all paid for by the government. And maybe a few little advertising things will happen. I know I'm pretty radical, but the point is the real benefit to humanity is to start mining metals where you don't damage your home planet. And you could make a lot of money and you could manufacture the products. And I'll give you a few more facts. It can't stop us when it's starting. The reason you want to manufacture in space is there's no sedimentation because there's no gravity. When you go to melt things, you could get differential sedimentation of impurities. In space, there's no sedimentation because there's no gravity. On top of that, on Earth, we have convection. Hot air rises. So if you look at any manufacturing process, because of convection, you get impurities in the products. So ultimately, it can happen in 25 years. There will be trillionaires. There will be manufacturing operations in the Earth orbit, much more so than the moon. And in doing that, we'll be able to go to Thank you very much.